this is probably going to be the most confusing of the weeks. Um, this is probably the part of the course that trips people up the most. Um, and so, you know, we're going to take our time with this one. Uh, so what we're doing today is we are going to be getting into uh, um, evaluative criteria. And uh, this, like I said, is something that that does tend to confuse people. Um, and so I'm going to kind of start off with an example or with a uh, an analogy, right? So I'm going to use a couple of analogies. Um, if you are say you're you're shopping for shoes, right? Um, and you're probably not going to walk into a shoe store and at random just grab some pair and say, this is the pair that I'm walking out with, right? You're probably got some things that you're going to be looking for in a pair of shoes. Uh, one, they've probably got to be your size, right? That's a good place to start. Uh, you know, and then two, you know, you might be interested in a certain type of shoe, right? I'm looking for a running shoe, or I'm looking for a dress shoe, or I'm looking for a boot, um, right? So, so type might be another thing that you're looking for. And then, of course, maybe waterproof, right? I want my shoes to be waterproof. Um, those characteristics that you're looking for are criteria, right? They are akin to the criteria that we use when we're assessing policies. We're not just going to grab a policy at random, but we are going to be looking for certain things um, that must be satisfied if we're going to recommend that policy. Um, so that's like the overly simplistic uh, analogy. Here's one that I think is a little bit more akin to something that you might feel uh, more comfortable with or more you use more often. So um, this is a rubric. Um, this is the rubric that I use to grade your work um, in this class. Um, and so you can see here along the left side, these are the criteria that I use that I look for when I'm grading your assignments. Um, you know, so I'm looking for clarity. Right, I'm looking for the degree to which you complete the assignment, um, you know, all parts of the assignment. I'm looking for the quality of your written communication, and I'm looking for the presence of APA citations. Um, so these are criteria, right? These are the characteristics that I'm looking for when I'm, I'm assigning a grade to your work. Um, and with these criteria here, I'm also establishing uh, what we're going to come to know as conditions. And I'm going to briefly touch on this, and then we're going to come back to it a little bit later on, right? So characteristics are proficient and advanced for each of these criteria. That's essentially what we're doing in policy analysis with our evaluative criteria. Um, it's a very similar process. We will be defining um, what terms, what characteristics we're looking for, and we're going to be defining what levels of performance are expected and what they mean uh, for each of those criteria. To clarify a little bit more, let's look at some commonly used evaluative criteria. These are the ones that are kind of the most common in the field of policy analysis. Um, and like I said, these are the elements that you're using to weigh your different policy options against each other, right? One of them is going to be the, the, the best option, the one that you're going to recommend. Um, and we've got to decide, well, how do we know which one is the best? Um, Right. These are the ways that we justify our our recommendations, right? And that we we convince elected officials that our recommendations are the ones that they should pay attention to. Um, so this uh, this is I've been teaching this specific uh, mnemonic device, I guess, if you want to call it for for several years. Um, but I call it the four E's. One of them is an F. It's a joke. Um, it's probably not a very good one, but that's that's what it is. Um, so quick way to remember them, effectiveness, efficiency, equity, and feasibility, right? Four E's. Um, uh, and, and they make sense, right, on their face, right? Effectiveness uh, is the likelihood uh, and extent to which a policy solution will impact the problem or will achieve our desired result, right? It's the, uh, the degree to which we can expect that policy solution to get us to that objective um, and fulfill our policy goals. Um, <clears throat> efficiency, right, is something you're all pretty familiar with. Uh, it, it, it's the 
likelihood that the returns to a policy will be worth the cost that we spend to implement it, right? Everything we do, every policy we, re we recommend is going to come with a cost, right? Someone's going to have to pay some money for it. Um, and we want to make sure that we're spending those dollars well, that we're getting an efficient return. Um, some students confuse efficiency and effectiveness or use these terms interchangeably until they get to this course. Um, you know, effectiveness, right, is the is the impact, right, the, the level to which we want to reach that desired end. Efficiency is how many resources, how much resource we spend uh, getting to that point. Um, Equity, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the, the kind of cardinal sin here of defining a word by using the word, um, is the likelihood to, to which a, a policy can be projected to bring about or enhance equity. Um, many of the policy problems that we are trying to solve have an equity component, right? Some groups are going to be impacted or experience a problem more severely than other groups. We would hopefully, right, look for um, our policy solutions to enhance equity. Uh, we would hope not to introduce policy solutions that that hinder equity, um, uh, you know, and and disadvantage some groups uh, or or advantage other groups. Um, and then lastly, feasibility. Right? Can the thing actually be done? Uh, I, I'm just leaving it here because there are several types of feasibility which we're going to get into. Um, but these are kind of the very basic criteria. Um, these are the ones that most people that you encounter on the street could probably understand. Um, so if you were explaining a policy to some person on the sidewalk, um, these are words that you could throw out and they'd be pretty, pretty familiar, pretty comfortable. They'd, they'd understand what you're talking about. The ones that we are going to be using um, are, are in Blackboard, but, but there are some other kind of more common criteria that are a little bit more detailed. Um, so remember I said there are several types of feasibility. Um, there are three kinds that we would, we would use in our study, right? So we would consider political feasibility, right? And this is just the likelihood that a policy uh, could pass the political process. Um, you know, what is the likelihood that policymakers in a given uh, municipality or state or even the federal government uh, would accept your policy solution and pass it into law and that executive would sign that law and make it official. This obviously requires knowing something about the, the political environment uh, that you're studying, right? It means knowing if I'm studying the city of Wilmington, I need to know um, how policymakers, right, how Wilmington City Council and the mayor's office uh, would approach or would react to my policy solution. So I would have to know kind of what the political environment is like. I'd have to know how those folks have voted on similar policies in the past, or, you know, whether some some policies you bring to them might just not, not go, they might not fly. Um, Administrative feasibility deals with the kind of bureaucratic infrastructure, right? And we're talking about staffing. Uh, we're talking about space and resources uh, to implement a policy solution. So we might have a really great idea for a program that might solve, um, you know, uh, youth, um, you know, youth activities, right? It might provide youth activities, but if that program takes 15 additional staff to implement. Um, right, that's going to be a mark against it in terms of administrative feasibility, right, the bureaucratic infrastructure isn't there. Or if we wanted, um, you know, even if we could hire more people, do we have the space to put them, right? Is our office big enough to accommodate 15 more staff members? And then, of course, uh, technical feasibility just means, like, is the technology in a place where this is a viable solution? Um, and the, a really great example of this in recent years is uh, body cameras on police. About 10 years ago, uh, even 12 years ago, that is not a technology that really existed uh, in any kind of uh, way that it could be practical. Um, you know, SD card storage was not as, as powerful as it is today. Um, and so it'd be the sort of thing where, you, you know, uh, the just storing the data wouldn't be technically possible, um, or at least not technically possible without, you know, carrying around a dozen different little SD cards to be able to change them in and out. 
Um, whereas, you know, technology has advanced to such a point today where the, the camera technology and the storage technology and our capacities for processing data are so much more powerful that that's a much more viable solution uh, today. Other criteria, uh, uh, you know, you might consider liberty or freedom, uh, you know, the impact, the potential impact on a person's ability to make choices and decisions for themselves, um, you know, or, or even legality, right? So you might propose a policy solution that might end up being illegal. It might violate a, a city ordinance, or it might violate the state constitution, or it might violate the federal constitution. Um, and so if you find a policy solution to, you know, not be legal, you know, it's, <laughs> it's not going to work. You can't, you can't recommend it. There are there are many many more of these. Uh, the Bardock book is really good for them, and I've also um, given some pretty I think I hope useful definitions in uh, in Blackboard. But these are are very general definitions. There's some more steps that we're going to have to take.